When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face toward Jerusalem. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a saying that's made the social media rounds in recent years, widely and mistakenly attributed to Mark Twain, which says, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you discover why you were born. For some reason, those who study Mark Twain for a living are really mad that this is attributed to him. It's something he would never say, apparently. Its origin is most likely a sermon. And it sounds like something someone like me would say in a sermon. In fact, with credit to whomever said it first, I'm saying it now, with a slight significant variation. The most important days of your life are the day you were born and the days, plural, for surely there are more than one, when you discover why. So let's start with the most important day, the first, to acknowledge that the fact that you and I are here at all is a miracle. The Celtic poet John O'Donohue, who himself left this earth far too soon, once wrote that it is strange for us to be here. The mystery of our existence never leaves us alone. Behind our image, below our words, above our thoughts, a world lives within us. We are fashioned from the earth, Yet we are souls in clay form. Tragically, in our mediocrity and distraction, we can forget that we are privileged to live in a wondrous universe. While we were born on a particular day, nearly everything about us on that day was as yet unrealized possibility. And every day since then has provided us opportunities to step toward or step away from whatever possibilities God placed within our DNA. And so I would say the next most important days are those when we move in a decisive way toward our destiny, when we set our faces toward our destiny, be it physical, emotional, spiritual, communal. The human journey is a continuous act of, of transformation. And once the soul awakens, this is Don O'Donohue again, once the soul awakens, the search begins and we can never go back. For there is in the human soul not only the desire to live, but this quest for meaning to life, for purpose, this desire to answer the most elusive of questions that we start asking at about age two. Why? Among all the species, we are God's meaning-making creatures. I spent much of my life thinking about questions of meaning and trying with varying degrees of success to answer them for myself. What I've learned is that this holy grail of our existence, this pearl of great price, isn't something to discover on a single day. For there are so many potential paths before us, so many ways to live a purposeful life, some of which we discover, in fact, early in our childhood, or others see it in us when we are young. Other paths reveal themselves to us over time, and still others are thrust upon us by circumstances we could never have anticipated and would not choose. Think of Ruth in this light. 
everything lost to her, choosing audaciously to bind her destiny to her beloved Naomi. This search for purpose is intrinsically linked to the mystery that we're here at all and that we continue to be here against the odds. Indeed, we feel this urgency of purpose most acutely, I think, whenever we've survived a trauma or a catastrophe that others did not. For not only do we realize anew what a gift our life is, but that the gift comes with a responsibility to live it well, if nothing else, to honor those whose lives were cut short. It is misleading, though, to suggest that we could discover this purpose in life in the way we might happen upon a coin on the sidewalk. And more often than not, we have to work for this. We have to work hard to create meaning or discover purpose, much the way St. Paul described. The, the work involves suffering, which produces endurance, which leads to character, which, if we're lucky, brings us hope. These are the raw materials with which to create a life of meaning. It's possible, of course, for any one of us to simply drift for years in numbing distractions or frenetic activity. It's possible, tragically, to have this sense of meaning beaten out of us by external cruelty or inner despair. It happens. Nonetheless, whenever any of us, by the grace of God, wakes up, claims our dignity and our destiny, whenever we stand up and realize that we have good and meaningful work to do and to do now, no matter what it is or how we came to it, no matter our age, our station in life, public recognition for this work or the lack of it, no matter if we succeed or fail in accomplishing that work, whenever we set ourselves toward our destinies, even if it means sacrificing ourselves so that others might live, then we are most alive. We are most fully human. And the glory of God, wrote one of the earliest Christian theologians, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. So think of those days, would you, when you knew what you needed to do and why? Think of the people, call them to mind, whom you admire most, past or present. Aren't they the ones that both knew the precious gift of being alive and had the perseverance to pursue a dream? There's considerable deba debate, actually, among Christians as to when Jesus knew. When Jesus knew why he was born, how and when it became clear to the very human Jesus of Nazareth that his destiny was to be the incarnation of God's love. The biblical account is predictably ambiguous. There are some versions that are emphatic that he always knew. From the womb, he knew. But most suggest that it was a series of revelations over time. At his baptism, when the Holy Spirit spoke to him. In the desert of his temptation, when he read in his hometown synagogue from the scrolls of Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for God has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. In his encounter with the Syrophoenician woman who dared him, to expand his horizons beyond his own people. And on the mountain of his transfiguration, when he realized with complete clarity that his destiny was to die young. There were a series of revelations, not just one. And because he realized at the end that he was to die, he needed not only a reason to live, but a purpose worthy enough to give his life, not my will, Father, 
thy will be done. And in light of that ultimate recognition, when he knew that the time for him was coming, he, he set his face toward Jerusalem. In other words, he walked. He walked from the region surrounding the Sea of Galilee in northern Palestine, where he grew up and where he had created quite a movement for himself. And he walked to the south, to Jerusalem, where all the ancient prophets of Israel went to die. And as you heard just now, walking with that kind of intention leaves little room for distraction or half-hearted commitment. You were with him or you weren't, but he was going. So I wonder, toward what destiny have you set your face? Have I set mine? I wonder, toward what collective destiny have we set ours? Today, here, we commemorate the birthday, if you will, of this cathedral, September 29th, 1907, which was when the foundation stone was laid. It lies deep beneath us. It's anchored on 11 feet of solid concrete, apparently, buried under half a million tons of Indiana limestone, but it's there. And in the heart of that foundation lies a smaller stone that came from Bethlehem. And on that stone are inscribed the foundational words of the Christian faith about Jesus, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 1907 was a heady time for our nation and for our church, and the event itself must have been something. President Theodore Roosevelt was there, the Bishop of London came, there were 62 bishops representing four continents of the Anglican Communion, all joining Bishop Satterley, first bishop of this brand new diocese of Washington. And one account of that day helps us picture the excitement. There's this new diocese, this new century, the emergence of the United States as a world power, the optimism born of prosperity and innovation, the belief, of course, that Episcopalians were destined to be the nation's spiritual leaders. All of this and more convinced Bishop Satterley and his financial backers to launch this audacious plan to build this huge Gothic cathedral from which they would watch over the capital. That day, too, was one of unrealized potential. And this cathedral's construction faced setbacks almost as soon as the cornerstone was laid. It's not inevitable that we are here. Um, within, a within a year, Bishop Satterley was dead. Uh, within a decade, World War I began, followed by the Great Depression and a Second World War, and successive deans, bishops, lay leaders, visionaries, and philanthropists would take their turn in trying to get this cathedral finished and at the same time, in their own time, address the question of why are we doing this? What is this cathedral's purpose, after all? Its reason for being. Well, today, we also remember a man who not only answered but embodied the cathedral's purpose with a compelling vision, deep faith, joyful spirit, and prophetic truth. We remember John Thomas Walker, who died 30 years ago on Cathedral Day. For many reasons, Bishop Walker stands out in the long line of admirable leaders, not the least of which was his determination to have the cathedral finish on his watch, debt-free, and with a compelling programmatic life that would be also fully funded. He was called to this place first as a canon missioner in the mid-1960s. He was a teacher, father of young children, and so he became particularly interested in the cathedral schools and also a champion for the public school system of Washington, D.C., an African-American whose life 
bridged the worst of Jim Crow and the struggles of the civil rights movement, the first to desegregate nearly every institution he attended or served, he knew the pernicious evil of racism and yet refused to be defined by it. Um, his children described their home as a refuge for many. People would come for dinner and stay for a year. He had the ability to treat everyone he encountered, be it a custodian or a president, with the same warmth and respect. He was in the eyes of some, and it's interesting to read back now, in the eyes of some a moderate, really. Yet he never shied from the pressing issues of his day. I never met him, but I saw him from a distance once. I was a seminarian, and I came to the anti-apartheid protests, and there he was, calm, cool, leading a group of clergy to be arrested. As a result of all this, John Walker was beloved as few leaders are, so much so that he was elected bishop of this diocese twice, first as suffragan, fancy word for assisting bishop, and then as the first African-American to serve as the diocesan bishop of Washington. And it was as bishop Walker realized that tending to both the cathedral's very existence and destiny fell to him. His predecessor had worked mightily to finish the centennial before the American bicentennial, but in 1978, construction was suspended for lack of funds. And in a move that still takes my breath away to think about, Walker named himself both bishop of the diocese and dean of the cathedral. And then he set about not only to raise the money to finish the cathedral, but to ensure that its purpose would never be in question. This was to be a house of prayer for all people. This was to be a church dedicated to national purpose, a sanctuary of spiritual beauty and artistic genius, a place of intellectual rigor, a place where social justice was advocated, proclaimed, and lived, a place of genuine hospitality. And he poured himself into the hard work of raising the money while embodying the mission every day of his life. And he inspired so many people to join him in that endeavor. He inspired a generation of young people, now leaders in their own right, to live purposeful lives. And then, on the day to mark the beginning of a full year of celebration of the cathedral's completion, Cathedral Day 1989, John Walker died. When you read the accounts of that day, you, you feel the grief rising from the page, the sense of loss, the free-flowing tears, the immediate resolve to carry his light forward. One noted laywoman of the church, Pamela Chinnis, wrote, John Walker's legacy to us, be we women, blacks, young persons, builders of this cathedral, is the conviction that what may seem impossible can be possible if we, like him, are faithful. Faithful witnesses to the God of justice and compassion. Many in leadership at the cathedral now, including our dean and the chair of the cathedral chapter, grew up here under the spiritual mantle of Bishop Walker. Others in this cathedral today were those who worked alongside him and taking up his work after he died. And I tell you, every day I'm here, I feel his spirit cheering us on. Dean Randy Hollerith recently wrote, wrote this. As we plot a course for the cathedral for the next five years, we choose to embrace all of its creative tensions rather than run from them. We cherish its multiple identities. In a world that seems to be in constant turmoil, our faith compels us to answer the prophet Isaiah's call to be repairers of the breach. We recognize that the stones made up of this cathedral 
you, th that with its rich history and visibility in our nation's capital need to be living stones, providing a distinctive voice within the civic and religious life of our city and country. And so in closing, I simply ask you again, reminding you that the most important days of your life are the days you were born and the days you discover boy. Why? And when you, like Jesus, set your face toward that destiny, what are you going to do now with your one wild and precious life? And to the leaders and members of this cathedral, may we know that the most important days of this cathedral's life include the day of its foundation stone being laid and all the other days when people like us rededicated ourselves to its mission and purpose. May God grant us all the wisdom and the courage for the living of this day. Amen.